to be moved by another person's suffering is part of what makes us human. People living on the streets of Spokane are certainly suffering, so much so that it can be hard to look. Well, 5,000 people are homeless in Spokane County at any given time. That number five times higher than previous surveys. And when we do look, we want to act, we want to fix it, we want to make the suffering go away. Compassion is an appropriate response to homelessness. There's no question about that. More and more transients are calling the area home, setting up an ever-growing number of campsites along the Spokane River. It is a very visible problem in Spokane. Homeless camps along the river, crowds around the House of Charity, and people sleeping in parks. The question, the one we really need to wrestle with, is what does true compassion look like? Well, homelessness in Spokane has dominated the conversation the last two months. We've reported on funding for shelters, protests, and concerns the issue is hurting downtown businesses. So how did we get here and what is the city doing about it? Some people define compassion as allowing people to live however they want. An addiction, sleeping on downtown sidewalks, camping on the steps of City Hall. This compassion gives and gives and gives, asking nothing in return. And many call this noble, but is it? To me, it seems like the homeless population downtown has just absolutely exploded. I look back to when I first started working downtown 25 years ago. Uh, on a busy night, we would see maybe three or four homeless in the entire city. And that was typically a busy night. Fast forward to where we're at 25 years later, and you can see three or four on one block. There is an increase in youth who are homeless. Last year, um, we had, in our visits to our drop-in center, we had 11, almost 12,000 visits to our drop-in center last year. Homelessness has evolved significantly in the last decade here, and particularly in the last few years, we're seeing a, a uptick of number of people who are homeless, but also uh, in kind of the level of interaction and uh, danger that is happening on the street. You see a lot more young people, you see uh, uh, just a larger volume of homeless in the downtown core here and the negative impacts that that is having on businesses and nonprofits and just I think the general environment downtown has become pretty evident lately. We work with young men and women 24 and under, so about between the ages of 16 and 24, and the things that they have to do to survive everyday living in abandoned buildings, um, the um, survival sex that they have to, to be involved in, uh, panhandling and all those kinds of things just to survive, let alone living outside. I remember one time there was a young man that was 23 below and he was living in a tent um, by the river. Homelessness is an issue that affects everyone in this community. Uh, this is really a statewide issue and we've seen over the last few years uh, really an explosion of homelessness, crime and addiction. Uh, I've seen that even here in my own neighborhood in Seattle and it's had a huge impact and I really wanted to find out why because I, I really was approaching this piece from this paradox that in King County right now, according to the Puget Sound Business Journal, we spend a billion dollars a year on the issue of homelessness, but it continues to get worse and worse and worse. And my question was why? How is it possible that we spend an astronomical sum of money, about $80,000 for every man, woman, and child experiencing homelessness, but we're not solving the problem? So if I look at the organizations that tend to be the most successful in the city, there are those organizations that are, are helping these individuals out with food, with clothing, with shelter, with job training, um, but there's also a certain level of accountability. Because what happens is if you keep pouring resources to individuals that don't have a desire to change, you're not going to change that behavior. I think Spokane does uh, a lot to help the homeless in terms of trying to get them off the street and into situations where they're safer, warm, perhaps healthier housing. Where that runs into difficulty is if you don't address the issues that made people homeless in the first place, uh, simply putting them behind a door doesn't make their life that much better. There's this idea that if you don't support the status quo, you don't care. You're uncompassionate. You're anti-homeless. And I actually think that the, the reverse is true. 
I think that the policies that we have today, despite the fact that people mean well, despite the fact that we spend a tremendous amount of money, are actually uncompassionate. Because I don't measure compassion by the inputs. I don't measure compassion by how much money you spend, how good you feel, or your good intentions. I measure it by outputs. How many people are sleeping on the streets? How many people are suffering from addiction? How many of the mentally ill are we leaving to die on the streets? And by no stretch of the imagination could you call the current status quo compassionate if you measure it by outputs. When compassion is separated from personal responsibility, it doesn't work. Compassion without accountability undervalues the contribution people can make to their own recovery and keeps them in a state of misery, just barely surviving. Homelessness in Spokane is exploding, not for a lack of funding or resources or attention, and certainly not for a lack of compassion. We need to admit that what we've been doing hasn't worked and consider a new approach. In 2005, Spokane launched the 10-year plan to end homelessness. The first point-in-time count in 2006, a one-day count of the homeless population conducted each January, recorded 1,592 homeless individuals. In 2018, after spending in excess of $161 million to solve the problem, the total was 1,245. Walking the streets of downtown Spokane, it is quickly apparent that the 10-year plan did not end homelessness. Too many people are sleeping in downtown doorways, rummaging through trash cans, seeking escape from personal torment through a bottle or a needle. And not too far from where we are at right now, down this dirt road by one of our one of our buildings down here, there was a dumpster and I might get emotional on this one, I, I'll try not to, but I slept next to that dumpster for a couple nights. I, I had, my options were exhausted, I'd burnt all my bridges, my relationships were nil, and I remember vividly thinking that I belonged in that dumpster with the rest of the trash. I had no worth, I had people walking by me, spit on me, avoid me, like I wasn't even there. It, there's homeless people that never have contact with law enforcement, never once have contact with law enforcement. They respect other people, they abide by the laws, um, they're not camping out in, in front of someone's business. But then you do have those others who in the small congested area of downtown want to camp out right on these sidewalks. So you have that balance between this person experiencing homelessness, but a business owner who has their life savings poured into this business as well, and they're hearing from their customers, I won't come down to your store anymore. It's just there's too many problems. I get uh, accosted or, or verbally challenged and sometimes even ask for money. It's just not comfortable for them. I never worked downtown prior to opening this business and, and I, I loved it. It's, it's a great place to work. I love being downtown. There's a lot of things going on down here that are fun and exciting and you want to be involved in. But you want to feel safe. You want to feel safe be walking from building to building down here because Parking is at a premium, so you want to just leave your car somewhere and be able to wander around. As well, so do the visitors that come to Spokane. And the thing that we hear and we've heard a number of times is, I'm not coming back to Spokane. I'm not, I don't feel safe, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to bring my family here because um, I don't feel like we're safe here. And that's the last thing as a business owner in downtown Spokane that you want to hear. We had to gate our front door uh, because it was a covered uh, stairway. So we had to gate it because every morning when we came to work, um, our front porch was filled with people. And then we gated it mainly because of safety for our employees. Another thing that um, has happened is we used to have a dumpster. I mean, you know, we're a furniture dealer and we have lots of empty cartons and everything. And the city used to pick up twice a week. And we had to remove the dumpster because we would come to work and all the cardboard would be pulled out. There would be people sleeping in our dumpster. So um, we had to get rid of our dumpster, and now we have to have trucks go to the dump a couple of times a week. A lot of people who have not been through some of these issues personally, it's easy to say, hey, just decide to change. And in a way, 
if it were that easy, we wouldn't have the problems that we do. Um, it's not easy. It, it's hard. And so if I have been used to a certain way of living for decades in some cases, I have very well-learned habits about how do I manage my emotions? How do I get enough to eat? Where do I live? And some of these create problems for that person in their relationship to society. They end up doing crimes. They end up uh, using substances which help their mood but is also a crime. And so they are now trying to learn new, better ways of, of living with their stresses and their life challenges. But they're also now carrying with them 10, 20, 30 years of bad habits. So it's not just starting over at ground zero. It's almost like starting below and getting back. Oh gosh, um, an absolute train wreck. My life had become such a mess because I didn't know how to function without that in my system. I didn't know how to go to a birthday party with my kids. I didn't know how to do anything, any special events without being intoxicated or having used. I just felt socially inadequate for lack of better terms. Once people have engaged in using substances, it changes your brain. We know that many of these substances will alter the chemical messengers, the neurotransmitters that are in the brain. And any type of treatment program needs to allow for a reprogramming, so to speak, of how these messengers talk with brain cells. And it's during that time that people have cravings, that they have the, the physiological desire for the substance. So, you know, the program, you need time in order to begin to walk through that in a way that doesn't involve more substances. And, and that's what I'm finding is, you know, instead of thinking of it like, you just need to go get a job, it, that's not it. They can't get a job. They are not employable. They, they come in and there is a definite drug addiction or mental illness going on when they do come in here and they'll turn on a, on a dime as to be violent or friendly, normal or abnormal. And, and so I know that person isn't employable. So we have to get them to a place to where they could be employable. And if that means we need to put them in rehab um, and it's getting them to go, that's, that's another issue is, is if they don't want to go, we can't force them to do it. What can we do? What can we do? You know, and, and that's what we're trying to come to a solution as business owners downtown is what can we do to help the situation where we're not just battling it every day? What can we do? Isn't that the question we are all asking? The federal government has directed most of its funding toward Housing First projects. The idea is solid. You can best deal with the underlying causes of a person's homelessness if you first get that person into stable housing. It's difficult to think about a job if you're worrying about what you're going to eat and where you're going to sleep. All too often, however, housing first becomes housing only, and the underlying causes are never addressed. People with mental health and addiction issues end up being unintentionally warehoused, grouped together in one facility, without the intensive counseling and case management they need in order to truly move toward richer, healthier lives. Chief Meidel described a concept called crime prevention through environmental design as a means of creating safer neighborhoods and a safer downtown core. It is my feeling that when you have people with very big, compassionate hearts, and they're, they're building all these homeless shelters. I absolutely appreciate where, where they're coming from and where their heart is, but I would be disingenuous if I did not tell you that concentrating uh, the homeless in a downtown area is going to lead to problems, especially surrounding those areas. We've had this really naive and really unsophisticated view that if someone is homeless and we give them a home or a place to stay, problem solved. But the fact is, is that according to data that's really been stable since the 1990s, 80% uh, of people who, en who are homeless uh, have lifetime drug and alcohol addictions. 30% have severe mental illness like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, and more than half of the homeless have, uh, a, have a prior uh, conviction for crimes. So we have to be really honest with what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with, in the majority of cases, 
uh, someone who the rents went up, they're out on the streets, give them some temporary housing, problem solved. The real challenge, the people that you see on the streets every day in cities like Seattle, Spokane, Tacoma, Olympia, the real challenge is addiction uh, and uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, opioid addiction, mental illness like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, that can't be solved through housing alone. You actually have to do the tremendously difficult work, the human to human work, the relational work, the immaterial work, even the spiritual work, to get people back on their feet. And these aren't problems that can be solved by a city council building 100 new housing units or a nonprofit organization handing out sandwiches under the bridge. This, this requires us to really have a deeper view and a deeper understanding of the problems. People who are homeless need people who are not to develop relationship with them. That can, that can happen over a cup of coffee and it can happen over years of a program in which life-on-life uh, life change happens. So I'm hopeful that going forward Spokane will invest more resources in things that build relationships in a community that help people actually escape the, the behaviors and the issues that create homelessness and become truly participating, productive parts of our, of our city. The number of solutions are, are equal to the number of people on the streets, right? Because it's so individualized. But I think generally um, what people are missing is relationship, right? They're missing healthy relationships. Kids enter the streets because of broken relationships, but I believe that they exit because of healthy relationships and having a mentor, right? So it's both individual relationships and it's a community of care. If I was just given a place to live, food, a car, whatever that looks like, if I was just given these things without having to work for it, my appreciation level wouldn't have been there. I would have lost it. I wouldn't have been accountable for it. I honestly, I wouldn't have cared. I would have had the mode of thinking where it was given to me once, it'll be, certainly be given to me again. I'll fall back into that entitlement mode. I'll, I'll fall back into that victim mode. You owe me. The difference now is I've earned this. And for the first time in 52 years, I have a right to celebrate and I have a right to be proud of myself. You know, I think that pain is, it's a good motivator and it's a good teacher. And to think that um, going through life pain-free as possible, I think is unrealistic. And so if we're compassionate towards someone, a lot of times we want to rescue them from the consequences of their poor decisions. But then they're not experiencing that pain. They're not experiencing that motivation to change. And they're not learning from that pain. And so it seems counterintuitive to allow them to go through that pain, but sometimes that's what we have to do to get them to grow and take that next step. Of course, nobody wants to uh, criticize a, an approach that addresses the basic needs of people. I don't think it's an either or situation, but I do think the bulk of our resources as a community, uh, whether they're governmental or non-governmental, should be at development. Uh, the reason being that the statistics also seem to show that if you simply put somebody in a building without addressing the reasons they were homeless in the first place, the incidence of homelessness increases over time. So why not put more of our resources towards those people who, okay, they have housing now, but in order to move to the next step, what has to happen? And those are the, that's the area that seems to be neglected in our approach to the homeless situation in Spokane. Food and shelter are critical, but they must serve as first steps, stabilizing steps, and a much more comprehensive plan that seeks to bring healing to the whole person. Trauma, addiction, mental illness, and family breakdown must all be addressed. Social service providers, nonprofit organizations, even government agencies cannot solve the issue of homelessness through handouts. What we can do is come alongside people who are suffering and be their partner. We can see people as individuals, recognize their potential, and offer the resources they need to turn their lives in a new direction. Kimmy, Rich, and Tyson were all addicted, homeless, and desperate. Today they are alive sober and full of hope. I was a person who 
uh, lived in a house with 15 other drug addicts because none of us could get a place. You know, somebody somehow owned the house, I think. And, you know, uh, it was like the house it was like there was boxes everywhere, like up to the ceiling. And there would be like what I called goat trails to go through the house, like to different rooms and stuff. But it was like there was no running water. There was no um, electricity a lot of times. And a bunch of cats. I mean, it was just crazy how the environments I had to be in were so gross. And I, you know, I wasn't able to hold down a job or get a place. So I was just, anybody that would take me in, let me stay on their couch for a while, you know, I would. I had access to the beer cooler. And so on the weekends with my friends, we liked to, to drink and have bonfires. And and I, I really liked what the alcohol did for me. I liked how, how it made me feel. And I thought, wow, this is wow, this is the good stuff, because it provides something for me that I enjoyed. And so, fast forward 20 years later, and that spiraled out of control to the point where now I'm living in Spokane, living on the streets. I have a son that that I don't have contact with. My family, they don't really want to have anything to do with me because they don't trust me, and because they can't continue to watch me destroy my life. And um, my addiction progressed to, from alcohol to marijuana to psychedelics to uh, intravenous meth, intravenous heroin, alcohol every day. Um, it took me to, to some pretty dark places. And, you know, I was just a, I was this good kid growing up in, this, in the town of Palouse. And because of these poor choices and the deception of substance abuse, now I'm on the streets. I'm stealing to support my habit, um, eating out of garbage cans. I'm living on the streets of Spokane. I needed to have a relationship back with my kids, and I was told that I could if I changed my ways. Yeah. I needed to get out of my addiction. I needed to be unstuck. I decided to go to the UGM crisis shelter, and I'm so thankful that I did, because there I found a new lease on life, accountability, a chance to figure out what it would be like to do it without being addicted to drugs. When I came here, I didn't trust anybody. Um, the, where the change happened was me, me being able to trust who I used to call staff here, who I now call my friends. I had to learn how to trust people. Having said that, that lends itself to the importance of being able to trust yourself. I had to get to a point where I could trust me. Um, I like who I've become. I've got a lot of work to do. I'm not done, recovery is just beginning, but it's, it's, it's a partnership, I can't stress that enough. So being able to stay at the crisis shelter and have structure and uh, then moving forward into recovery and having somebody walk alongside me and hold me accountable made all the difference. Had somebody just handed me an apartment and let me go, I wouldn't have lasted. I'd have done what I'd done every time. Let all my friends come over, use it as a place to do, you know, drug exchanges. I would have probably not paid the rent for a couple months, just waited to get kicked out. And so when I was locked up, I was more free locked up, learning about Jesus than I was out on the streets doing whatever I wanted. And so what I needed, really what I needed was um, I needed a safe place to go. Uh, I went to the program of Adult and Teen Challenge. I needed a safe haven to go where where I could uh, be around other men who were going through similar things as me um, to help encourage me and help me take my next step in being a disciple of Christ. What it, understanding what, what does it mean to be a man of God? UGM was, was instrumental and I, they'll, they'll forever be in my prayers for what they do. They, the biggest thing that they've done for me is help me become accountable. They explained to me right off the bat that this is a partnership, you have to want this. If you don't want it, then you're just gonna go through life, the rest of your life just checking boxes. You have to enter, you have to be able to do the work. You have to admit you have a problem to begin with. And part of that also is admitting who you became and, and grieving that because until you can do that, you will forever be stuck in that victim mode. And it, when you're in that victim mode, you expect, expect, expect without giving. You have to be able to give your part. Those things made a difference, right? Like. If I was sitting next to Sally Sue and she was getting loaded, I would be following her out of the building. So not being, having to be right in it is a good thing. It's what kept me sober. 
it kept me from going to use because I didn't want to go back to living on a couch in a in you know in that environment. Like I was in a place that I could actually move forward. They were showing me that I could make it better for myself by pitching in and being there daily and that I could change my future. I feel like I can contribute now. I can contribute not only to my, my father's life, my dad's, my son, my son and daughter's life. I can contribute to my life. I can start taking charge of me. What people are lacking, what people are needing is a sense that they can restore a dignified, independent, self-sufficient life where they're truly contributing members of community. And that's the goal that we have to set. We have to set our, our North Star um, really towards helping people not only get back on their feet and into housing and treating their any problems they have, but actually saying, you know, there's much more that you can do. You can actually be a integral part of this community. You can have, uh, uh, you, you can have all of those dreams that you may think are, are, have disappeared and have vanished over the course of ending up on the streets. They're actually still available to you. Here are some people who have been through it. Here are some lives that have been transformed. Here are some inspirational vision of what you can achieve. And if you come with us, we'll help you get there. Um, not from the top down, not looking down on people from a position of superiority or a position of power, but really from an even position. You know, compassion in an original sense means suffering with. The actual Latin roots of the word compassion are suffering with. And unless as policymakers, as community leaders, and as community members, unless we're actually willing to do that, unless we're actually willing to go shoulder to shoulder with people, to actually go through some of the challenges and struggles with them, we're not gonna make a difference. But if we are willing to do that, if we're willing to get in there and deal with the messiness of human relationships, uh, deal with the inevitable disappointments and problems and setbacks, um, but really walk through this with people, if we can do that, uh, we can actually start making true progress on solving this problem. Compassion isn't handouts. Compassion is relationship. And yes, it will be messy. There will be disappointments. But it's the only way forward. We must look people in the eyes, believe they have infinite value, and call them to live into that value. All the while, walking alongside, being present, listening, and when needed, offering appropriate resources. Compassion is most effective when it's paired with personal responsibility. Let's begin with the end in mind. What do we want for people experiencing homelessness? Do we just want them off the streets? Or do we want to see them living healthy, whole, productive lives? <laughs>